from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. I'm Senior Pastor Tony Sundermeyer, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. And I would invite you now to join us in the worship of God. Good morning. Please join me in turning your pew Bibles to Psalm 139, which can be found on page 545 in the Old Testament. Listen for and hear the word of the Lord. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word on my, on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in by, behind me and before me and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The light is as bright as a day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How, how weightly to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Please turn with me to your pew Bible to Jeremiah, first chapter, starting in verse 4, which can be found on page 656 of the Old Testament. Listen for and hear the word of God. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, uh, Lord God, truly you do not know how to speak. Truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, and to build and to plant. This is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Before we begin, I must say, it is good to be home. Someone took my pew, but it is good to be home. <laughs> Last time I stood in this pulpit to speak with you all, it was February the 14th, 1999, Valentine's Day and Youth Sunday, and I was a senior here. As I look out today, I see many, many familiar faces and thankfully lots of new ones, but I especially take note of one familiar face, 
who has been here the entire time, for someone who <clears throat> helped me to understand and to recognize and to see God's call upon my life, and for someone who I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I would not be where I am today without you, Allison. So thank you. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we ask now that these, your familiar words, might be opened to us in a new way this day. So we ask specifically that you might open our eyes and our ears, that we might see and hear something new to us this day, and that those words might carry us out into the world a different person. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it seems like it took her a really long time, but she finally made it. Yes, Claire Perlee finally made it to sixth grade. <laughs> For those of you who didn't know, that was the plan all along, right? Allison was going to serve as youth pastor until one of her kids was in the youth group and then step aside and let someone besides mom take over. So here we are today, some 10 years later, celebrating the fact that God had a slightly different plan for Allison. It's funny how that turns out. Our scripture lessons this morning introduced to us a God who perhaps even chuckles at situations like this. Our self-made blueprints. It's also a God that continues to call us beyond the familiar and out of our station in life. Lord, you have searched me. You have examined me and you know all of my ways. These are the opening words from our psalm. It is a prayer of a reflective individual to an all-encompassing divine presence that is well acquainted thoroughly and intimately familiar with the human being, even to the extent that this great source of life knows me better than I know myself. Author and scholar Thomas Merton echoes this sense of knowing in a prayer that he wrote. He says, my Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. The psalmist continues, you know me when I sit down and when I stand up. You're in front of me, but also behind me, even before we have moved our tongue to articulate a single word, even before we know what we are going to say. The word is already known to you. And, and not only that, there is nowhere that you can escape me. You cannot run away, you cannot hide from me. Now in a day and age where we have a real sense of value on our personal space and privacy, we also display even our deepest emotions on our walls or in our feeds. And so perhaps we're not really sure what to make of this passage this morning. And it seems pretty invasive to me, does it not? But the relationship described here is meant to be wonderfully reassuring. The psalm proclaims a relationship that, with a God that is deeply, deeply personal, personal but never private. Describes a God that knows me, a God that cares about me and seeks me out, even forming me in my mother's womb. A God that knows my heart and my soul. But it's not just my God, as in God of my choice. This is Yahweh, a God with a name and a history, the God who sent Jesus and the God who chooses Israel and who chooses me and who chooses you. As we see in our second text, it's also a God that chooses Jeremiah. Here we have a case study of what it looks and feels like to be appointed by God, 
The word that the author uses for to know refers to the same intimate, experiential, and complete knowledge that we find in our psalm. And it also refers to a complete consummation of this relationship. God's relationship with Jeremiah was fully ordained. It was completed and perfected even before the beginning of time. God has the beginning and the middle and the end of Jeremiah's life already in his care. So he imagines great things for Jeremiah and constantly fills the young prophet with energy and with inspiration. God imagines possibilities and provides encounters and gives guidance that will help Jeremiah embody God's vision. It also shows us an intentionality of this call. God addresses particular people in particular places at particular times. He had a specific purpose for Jeremiah, to be prophet to all nations. Similarly, we celebrate this morning that God has a specific and unique purpose for all of the faithful. Tony Campolo is a Baptist minister and author, and he says this about his wife. She's a brilliant woman. She has a PhD and is capable of pursuing a very profitable career. But she elected to stay home with her children when they were young. Now, her decision didn't bother her at all, except when other young women would ask, so what do you do? She would answer, I'm a homemaker, I stay home and I take care of my children and my husband. You can imagine some of the responses that she typically, typically got. Oh. So Ms. Campolo came up with a different response to that unnerving question. The next time she was asked, Ms. Campolo, so what do you do? Well, since you asked, I am socializing two homo sapiens in Judeo-Christian values so that they will appropriate the eschatological values of utopia. And what do you do? <laughs> you see, being chosen by God is an awesome responsibility, but it's also a little bit daunting. In The Lord of the Rings, Frodo asks Gandalf, why me? Why am I chosen? Gandalf replies, such questions cannot be answered, but you may be sure that it was not for any merit that others do not possess. You have been chosen, and you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. Can you just see Jeremiah looking around? Who, me? You want me to do what? But the divine response is similar to Gandalf. Do not be afraid. Do not ask questions. Just go where I send thee. Do and say as I tell you. Jeremiah's initial response is fairly typical. At some point in the process of discovering God's call on your life and on claiming your gifts, whether that is a, as a prophet for all nations or as a math teacher or as a homemaker, you perhaps will go through the same thing that the greatest ordained leaders went through. Perhaps you won't feel qualified you won't feel worthy. Can I really do this? How do I know? I am just a boy. But claiming not to know how to speak isn't much of an excuse when dealing with the one who knew us before we were born now, is it? Thankfully, the numbers are also in our favor. God's promise to empower faithful ministry is repeated in every single incidence of his call upon those that are recorded in scripture. But the only way that we can come to fully understand this is when we recognize that this call from God is not based on our own self-importance, even our charismatic abilities, nor is it limited by our sense of inadequacy. 
but instead it involves our responses to God's choices. God has patiently been calling for most of a lifetime to get Allison to this day. Having answered God's call before, she is discovering the intentionality and the persistence of this call. In Marilyn Robinson's novel, Gilead, the narrator, Pastor John Ames, also ponders a lifetime of listening for God's call. He reflects upon his accumulation of life experiences and how they wove together a rich tapestry whose beautiful texture could only result from many different strands, failure and frailty, memory and mystery, darkness and disappointment, regret and reconciliation. But weaving it all together was sheer gratitude and joy at how remarkably beautiful the resulting garment of his life was. Allison, I hope that as you look out today, you too see a beautifully knit garment. Because this is what the church is called to be. The church is called to be a place where gifts and possibilities and vocations are intentionally nurtured as our contribution to actualizing God's vision here on earth as it is in heaven. But let me be clear. We are not here to make a minister. Listen to these words. It is not to confer on this our sister the right to preach the gospel. If she has not that right already, we have no power to communicate it to her. Nor have we met to qualify her for the work of the ministry. If God and mental and moral culture have not already qualified her, we cannot by anything we may do by way of ordaining or setting her apart. So I was sharing with you these words about our duty in this process. It is not to confer on this our sister the right to preach the gospel. If she is not that already, we have no power to communicate it to her. Nor have we met to qualify her for the work of the ministry. If God and mental and moral culture have not already qualified her, we cannot by anything we do by way of ordaining or setting her apart nor can we by imposition of our hands confer on her any special grace for the work of the ministry, nor will our hands, if opposed upon her head, serve as any special medium for the communication of the Holy Ghost as conductors serve to convey electricity. No, such ideas belong not to our theory, but are related to other systems and darker ages. These words were preached nearly 150 years ago by Reverend Luther Lee on the occasion of the ordination of Miss Antoinette Brown, the first woman ever ordained in modern times. You see, folks, although we celebrate today, the calling to the ministry is not found in ordination. Instead, it is rooted in the waters of baptism the Lord calls us to all tasks. Sometimes it's raising children. Sometimes it's serving as prophet to all nations. But whether lay minister or ordained minister, our mission from God begins at the font. And it begins in relationship with a God who knows us better than we know ourselves. So we gather here today because God has marvelously set apart each and every one of us. You too have been called. You have a call story. It may not be as dramatic as Jeremiah's. Perhaps it's not even as long and drawn out as Allison's. But it is important for you. And it is important for the church and it is important for God to be formed. To be set apart, known and appointed by God is a testament to God's love for us and faith in us. 
Jeremiah's encounter reminds us that the Creator is not simply just aware of our existence, but is actively involved in our development. Most importantly, that God has a plan for each of us. We will not all be called to pro be prophets, but we'll equally be called to important and life-changing work, acting as companion for the sick and the dying, champion for justice in the face of oppression, or perhaps raising up a generation of world changers. And so as we respond to God's call, we too become part of a grand plan where all of our unraveling strands are transformed into the beautiful tapestry that God intends. And so I reiterate the sentiments of Reverend Luther Lee at that ordination service so many years ago. We, you and I, are not doing anything here today. At least we're not doing anything that God did not already do years ago. No, instead, in some ways, we are just catching up with God's work in Allison's life. Enough to say that she is indeed one of the ministers of the new covenant, authorized, qualified, and called of God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will all do well to watch the grace with which she carries the title reverend. Amen. Please be seated.
peace.